Peter chapter three. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Second Peter chapter three, verse four. God bless y'all. Welcome to Bible Believers Baptist Church. Where? The name says it all. The name says it all. Amen. I love it when you guys do that. And uh, because the name does say it all, doesn't it? Yes. And uh, we believe the Bible around here. We've been doing this study on on uh, uh, the second advent of Christ. And at this point in time, it seems like maybe the last three, I, I lose track, maybe the last three, maybe the last four um, we're talking about the rapture in connection with the um, second advent. The second advent is the second time that Christ comes to earth. At the second advent, the first advent, he came as a suffering lamb. He came to uh, be taken to the cross as a um, lamb is taken to the slaughter, amen? And he came to die and to save, seek and to save that which was lost. The second time he comes, it's not to seek and to save that which is lost. It's, he's coming to destroy the workers of iniquity and to establish his kingdom here on earth. And so that's why the Jews miss the first advent because probably two thirds of the prophetic verses about the Jews Messiah deal with the second advent. So the Jews are looking for a conquering king, not a suffering lamb. And, and of course he's gonna come as a conquering king. And if they paid attention to um, the prophecies about him, the Bible prophesies that when he comes and they see the, the scars, that they're gonna mourn, they're gonna go, Jesus was our Messiah. And it says that they're gonna mourn for him. So in 2 Peter chapter three and verse four, the Bible says, um, let's look at verse 3. Knowing this verse, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Um, let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, we do pray for your blessing on this message today. It's a message that doesn't really get preached that much. And Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to have ears to hear, hearts to apply um, fortitude to do what you think is right despite what the rest of the world is doing. God, we just love you. We praise you. We look forward to your coming. We want you to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So last week we continued uh, our study about the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as our opening text says, there are scoffers. Those scoffers are all over today. People saying that very thing. Where is the promise of this coming? You know, where, where, you know, he's supposed to have come. And of course, history has been filled with date setters that say, well, it's going to happen at this time and it's going to happen at that time. And the last big one that I'm aware of is everybody thought it was going to happen in the year 2000. I, I don't know. I guess they figured that when the clock hit 2000, the Lord had to come. <laughs> well, here it is 2024 and he hasn't come yet. And some of those people that were caught up in that year 2000 thing, our folks that are saying, where's the promise of his coming? He should have come 24 years ago, yeah. and he didn't. And um, what they don't understand is it's God's timetable, not your timetable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they based it on several different things that he would come at the year 2000. They based that on several different things, not the least of which was Y2K. <laughs> what does Y2K have to do with God? No. Amen? Nothing. Yeah. Okay. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. So there's millions of people in our current age that don't believe for a minute that Jesus is coming back to set up any kind of kingdom on earth. Isn't that sad? Very when the Bible's so clear about it? Mm -hmm. The Bible's clear about that. And these are prophetic. I'm not talking about the lost people. The, the lost people are going to believe whatever lost people are going to believe. There's Christians, professing Christians who don't believe that God is ever going to come back and set up his kingdom here on earth. And of course, there's those who think that we have to get the earth ready for his kingdom, like he, God's dependent upon us. If God's dependent on us, then the kingdom won't come because we're not good enough to prepare the world for the kingdom. We're just not good enough to do it. So as we were studying last week, we were looking at the connection between the rapture and the second advent, and we're talking very specifically about what our new bodies will be like. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. 
And um, I think we looked at a lot of things that um, give us some clue. We don't know exactly. We don't know exactly. The Bible doesn't spell it out crystal clear, but there was a lot of things that we looked at from the Bible that gives us some good ideas. And, and um, I, but I do use the term might, you know, we, we, we might have gotten some clear stuff because the Bible isn't specific about it. And so what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to put my feelings into something the Bible's not specific about and try and bring specificity to it. How do you like that word? Whoa. Um, when, when it doesn't, when specificity doesn't exist. So I can say this is my ideas, these are my thoughts. What I did is I tried not to give you necessarily my ideas and thoughts. I gave you what a lot of different preachers teach. And I showed you the verses that they look at to teach what they teach. And um, I think any one of them could be accurate to some degree or another. People say, do you think we're all going to be 33-year-old males? I don't know that we're all going to be 33-year-old males, but I know that that's a possibility. If that's what God wants to do, he can do it. Um, I, you know, having never been a female, I don't know how a female feels about, I don't know that I want to be a male. I don't know how, maybe girls don't want the idea of being a, a, a male. And so the Bible doesn't say that you'll be males. It says that you'll be like Christ and you'll be like the angels. And they, the folks that conclude that everybody's going to be males is because Christ was a man and because there's not a female angel in the Bible. But being like something isn't an exact thing. It's like. It's like. So you may not be males. Gals. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we know that one thing for sure we know is that we're going to be changed. The Bible is very specific about that. We'll be changed in a twinkling of an eye. Uh, we won't be the same as we are right now. And, and we're still going to look like human beings, but once again, we don't have the restrictions of time, space, or the limitations of this physical body. And we talked about how God went from earth to heaven and back down to earth in one day. And we're going to be like that. We're going to be able to bounce back and forth. I don't know if we will. I, I presume we will because the Bible says that, that uh, we're going to rule and reign with Christ. And I imagine we're going to be going back and forth. The Bible says that we will cons consistently be with him. And so if he goes to heaven, we're going. And if he comes to earth, we're coming. <laughs> Amen. Do I have a question? Yeah. Why would we want to come back? When you say come back, go back and forth. Yeah. Um, I thought heaven was pain free. We'll be pain free. And all that. Whether, so whether, we're, whether we're coming back or not coming back, we're going yeah. to be pain free. Right. But we're going to be, um, I believe that we're going to be coming back, not because we're coming back. It's not like reincarnation where we're right. going to come back as humans and relive another life on earth. Right. We're going to have our changed bodies and we're going to be like Christ and we're going to be with him. And I can tell you this, being with him is going to supersede anything. Um, the, the glory of being with Jesus is going to be the biggest glory that any creation could possibly fathom. And so... Um, you got to re remember this. Uh, the Bible says that when, when the second advent happens at the end of the millennial reign after the second advent, God's going to destroy this world by fire. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Mm -hmm. And we're going to rule and reign with him, which means um, it's not like we're going to be humans on earth again. We're going to be like the angels. We're going to be... Uh, um, basking in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and doing his will. And um, that's what we're going to be doing here on earth. And so uh, to us, heaven is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be in heaven, whether we're on earth or whether we're up in the third heaven, we're going to be in heaven, if that makes sense. Yeah. So <clears throat> the one thing I'm absolutely sure about is this. Whatever type of body we have is going to be far superior to what we currently have, mm -hmm. and we're going to love it. Yes. We're not going to have any pain. We're not going to have any suffering. Um, we're not going to have any of the... You ever look in the mirror and go, where did that wrinkle come from? I do. <laughs> look in the mirror and go, where did that... Hey, wait. The last time I had to renew my driver's license, Lisa informed me, because we did it through the mail, 
She said, oh, by the way, just so you know, I changed your hair color from blonde to gray. <laughs> when you look in the mirror and go, where'd all that gray hair come from? I remember uh, we went to Mike's wedding. You guys love Mike, my oldest son. We went to him and Caitlin's wedding, and I was with my granddaughter. Uh, it was, they did it by, uh, I think it was by Puget Sound, wasn't it? Was that where the water was? Yeah. Was it Puget yeah. Sound? They did it by Puget Sound, and um, I'm standing at a guardrail with my um, granddaughter, and um, granddaughter, I think that it was, um, Avery from John's daughter, and her and I are visiting, and we're looking over at the the handrail. There's probably some kind of seals or something down um, in the water, or whatever. And somebody took a picture of us from behind, and a couple months later, they posted those pictures. And Lisa said, "Look at this one." I looked at it. I said, "Who's the old guy with gray hair with Avery?" And she said, "Because my back was so I couldn't tell it was me." <laughs> she goes, "That's you, honey." <laughs> so you look at your gray hair and you go, "Where did all that gray hair come from?" Right? We're not gonna. That, it comes from sin. Mm -hmm. Our aging stuff comes from sin, mm -hmm. and um, we're not gonna have any of those ravages, rabbit, ravages of sin. Well, we're gonna have our real hair color. We're gonna not have wrinkles all over. Um, before Lisa's dad passed away, Lisa went up to visit him, and uh, he's talking with her, and, and it, she's the second oldest of the kids. And he goes, oh, my first daughter to get gray hair. And Lisa's response was, no, Dad, I'm the first daughter that doesn't color it, so you don't see it. <laughs> but her and her sisters have had gray hair for quite some time, and yeah. these sinners, says the white-haired guy. <laughs> My hair, to me, when I look at it, especially in the sunlight, it doesn't look gray, it looks white. But that's aging, that's, that has to do with sin. And, and uh, we're gonna love our new body, folks. We're gonna love it. Uh, Lisa and I started, uh, being that we're done with summer um, um, renovations on this building, and we're gonna take some time off for probably the entire winter and hibernate, I guess. But because of that, we started going back to the athletic club and working out again. My legs today are sore, folks. They're sore. We're not going to have that kind of stuff. We're not going to have any need to exercise our bodies to keep them in shape. And um, anyway, let's uh, turn our attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17. First Thessalonians, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 17. It says, then, which we, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So that kind of hits that question, um, uh, Angie, about why would we be going back and forth? We're ever going to be with the Lord. Where he is, we're going to be also. And we're going to bask in that. We're going to love being with the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so um, this is the verse that specifically talks about the rapture of the church. You know, the, the fact that there's supposed scholars and preachers today that say that the rapture of the church is a recent teaching that came about in the 1800s. No, Paul taught it in 1 Thessalonians in the first century, right? Um, um, and we see this, let's go back and read verse 16. Let, let's read them together, 16 and 17. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's the resurrection. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so um, caught up together. We're going to focus on that phrase, um, that phrase a little bit. And that's the title of today's message, getting together at the rapture. Getting together. That, that has multiple applications. Getting together at the rapture. So um, we are, we'll, we'll be caught up together, together. And so the statement bears many meanings. The term caught up has significant meaning. Caught up, 
the word caught up. Uh, I've heard preacher, heard people preach it that the term caught up implies taken by force. Now force, I think in most people's minds has a negative connotation, but force doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation. Um, believe it or not, when you are entering the highway and you put your foot on the gas pedal, there's a force that pulls you along. You want that force because it's going to keep the car that's coming down the highway already from hitting you, right? Right. Yeah. And so force doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation, but when people think of force, they think of like military force or something like that, and it brings a, a negative connotation in their mind. We will be taken by force. It's and it, because it's not our power. Just like when you accelerate that car, it's not your power. It's the power of that. What is your uh, Mach one have in it? A four four twenty eight. That four twenty eight is the thing that brings that power, right? And the smoke from your tire spinning, <laughs> right? It's not your power, and we're not going to be raptured through our own power. It's going to be through the power of the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and so, and the Bible says that we're not even going to, I don't even think we're going to be aware that it happened because that change happens in a twinkling of an eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's like we're going to, I mean, let's say the Lord happened, raptured us right this moment. None of us would even be cognizant of the fact that we were raptured. We're just going to be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Boom. Yeah. And we're going to be going glory, glory, glory. The four and twenty elders, glory, glory, glory. That's where that song, glory, 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 Lord God Almighty. It comes from the Bible where the four and twenty elders, that's what they do continually. Glory, 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 Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen. And people go, well, that doesn't sound like a fun existence. Oh, it's going to be a fun yeah. existence. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a fun existence. But I've also heard... They preach that this term means being snatched away out of danger. And that's true too. What danger? The great tribulation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so being snatched away out of great danger with the implication that this snatching away would be pre-tribulation. And we're going to look at some verses. We may not get to them today. I don't know because I don't rush things. <laughs> but we're going to look at some verses that will show you that we're not meant to go through the tribulation. Christians today, in the, the, the dispensation of grace, we're not meant to go through tribulation. What is tribulation for? It's for the Jew. It's called a time of Jacob's trouble. Are you part of Jacob? No, no. So I believe both those um, sentiments or both those statements are accurate. It's going to be a, a taken by force but it's also going to be um, snatching away um, out of great danger. When I was a kid, I was probably about eight years old. And uh, I wasn't raised in church. I just wasn't. I don't want anybody to think that I was a good little Christian from the time I was knee high to a grasshopper to my adulthood. I didn't get saved till I was in my 20s. So I'm about eight years old, and we lived in a little town in Washington State, Moses Lake, Washington. I don't know if any of you are familiar with where that's at, but we lived in Moses Lake, Washington. My dad was a state patrolman. Uh, my grandmother uh, lived in Spokane, Washington. And my dad was a huge Eddie Arnold fan. I don't know if you know who Eddie Arnold is. He's an old country singer. Did, did probably one of his most famous songs was called The Cattle Call. Dad loved that song. He played it, he bought the record and played it over and over again. Anyway, Eddie Arnold was coming to Spokane, Washington. So my grandmother got tickets and called Dad and said, why don't you come up here and we'll all go see Eddie Arnold. Well, my dad was thrilled. So we went up to Spokane and I believe, I don't remember for sure because I was just eight years old, but I believe my grandmother, my step-grandfather I know they had a cabin on the lake but I think it was Nine Mile Lake I don't know. this might not mean anything to anybody but it doesn't matter but they had a place right on the lake they had their own dock going out on the lake and he had a motorboat well me and my brothers 
I was the youngest of three. I, we didn't have any sisters. It was all boys, and we were ruffians. We went down, and we were on the dock, and I got the great idea. We'd start throwing rocks into the lake, right? So we're out there throwing rocks into the lake. And Dad hollered down, you boys knock it off. One of you is going to fall in. Well, I had to throw one more rock, and I fell in. <laughs> and so, fortunately, Dad was, because I didn't know how to swim. Fortunately, Dad was on the um, dock at the time that I fell in. And he said, my feet were like, I was face down in this water, because I didn't know how to swim to get my head up. I was face down in the, the water, straight up and down. My feet were bobbing like a bobber on a fishing line. And my dad reached down and pushed on my feet. And when they pushed on my feet, that spun me around and I came up with my head. And dad snatched me out of great danger. Amen. He grabbed me and pulled me out of that water. And um, I was wearing the only suit that I owned because we were going to Eddie Arnold that night. And uh, they tried to throw my clothes in the dryer and get them dried out so I could go to Eddie Arnold in, in comfort, I guess. But they never did get completely dried out. And I was damp all the way through the concert. But that's neither here nor there. But he saved me out of great danger. I didn't know how to swim. If he wouldn't have been there, I probably would have been drowned. And uh, the devil would have been happy about that. So I believe that when, when the Bible speaks of being caught up, it's talking about snatching us away from the danger of that great tribulation. And um, uh, the tribulation is a time of great trouble for Israel. It's not for the Gentile. We see the prophecy of the great tribulation in Jeremiah chapter 30. Go back to Jeremiah. Back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 30, and let's look at verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 30. Is that in the Old or New? It's in the Old Testament. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 1. We're going to read all the way through verse 17 because this is a prophecy about the tribulation. And... Um, It says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel saying, write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, <clears throat> excuse me, for lo the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. That doesn't sound like a time of fun, does it? Mm -hmm. Verse 7. Alas, for the, that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even a time of Jacob's, whose trouble? Jacob's. Jacob's. Jacob's trouble, not the world's trouble, Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Now, at the writing of this, David's been dead for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's something that's going to be, Israel's being prepared for something, and they've got to go through a whole heap of trouble to be prepared for it. Amen? That's the whole purpose of the tribulation, to prepare Jacob, to prepare Israel. Amen? Verse 10. Therefore fill thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations. What? All the nations except Israel are going to be made an end. <laughs> 
Whether I have scattered thee, I will, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. For thus saith the Lord, Thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. Therefore is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not, for I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one. God's saying, I'm going to chastise him like a cruel person chastises somebody. Amen. For the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased, why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. I have done these things unto thee. Therefore, all they that devour thee shall be devoured. And all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. And they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. And so there's some of your prophecies about the tribulation. Every nation is going to turn against Israel, including America. Yeah. Every nation is going to turn against, and it's going to be the end of every nation. And when God creates a new heaven and a new earth, guess what? It's going to be Israel that inhabits this earth. <laughs> Not all the world. It's going to be Israel. And so the great tribulation is known as the day of wrath. The day of wrath. Of God's wrath. And so Zephaniah 1 gives us another picture of the start of the Great Tribulation. So head back. It's still in the Old Testament, but you got to head back like you're going back to the New Testament. You're going to go past Ezekiel, and, and, and you're going to go past Daniel, and you're going to go past Hosea, Amos, Micah. Zechariah, right after Zechariah. Uh, no, you're going to go Zephaniah before Zechariah. If you hit Zechariah, you went too far. Mm -hmm. Zephaniah chapter 1. It gives us another picture of the start of the Great Tribulation. And so God used um, different prophets to say the same thing, but they say it in different ways. That might give you some insight as to why there's four Gospels. Four different accounts and people say that the gospels prove that the bible is not the word of god because the, the accounts don't line up like one account may say two angels appeared and another account might say one angel appeared but you know what if you have if you witnessed an, um, an accident of some kind and the police came and said what did you see one witness may say well there was this guy that did such and such and so and so and that's what happened Another one might say, well, there are two guys standing there, but that one guy did such and such and so on. The testimony is the same. It's just one mentions both folks instead of one folk. Mm -hmm. And so in the tomb, that one account says that there were two angels in there. One said there was an angel in there. Maybe the one that says there was an angel in there was only referring to the angel that spoke. The other angel didn't speak. It's not a contradiction. <laughs> It's just a different account. And I think God does it that way so that if you don't want to believe, you can find excuses not to believe. So we're in Zephaniah chapter 1. Look at verse 14. Zephaniah 1, 14. It says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth, and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath. You see that? Mm -hmm. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wastedness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day uh, of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Doesn't that sound similar, but just a different account? Mm -hmm. They've sinned against the Lord. Where did I leave off there? 17, halfway. Yep, 17. Um, 
because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be destroyed by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of them that dwell in the land. A day of God's wrath. The day of the Lord in the Bible is the second advent. The day of the Lord. And I'm telling you, the second advent starts with the rapture of the church. That's part of the second advent. Then you have the great tribulation, which is referred to, I mean, this is a description of the great tribulation. And it's referring to it as the day of the Lord, the second advent. So the purpose of the tribulation is God's exercising his wrath against Israel, not against the church. <laughs> it's against Israel. Being the tribulation is a time of God's wrath. We need to pay attention to what Paul told the church at Thessalonica. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, if you remember, we saw the calling out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, right? Yes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse um, 17 was the actual rapture of the church. And then we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that that day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So it's using the term the day of the Lord. So that connects Zephaniah with it, right? Because Zephaniah said this is the day of the Lord. And it said it's a time of God's wrath. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Didn't our example in uh, um, oh, what did I give you before uh, Zephaniah? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Didn't Jeremiah. the uh, text in Jeremiah say that men were bound down like a woman in travail? And here you see okay. this connecting that with Ze uh, um, Jeremiah with Zephaniah. Okay. Amen. That connects it to okay. them. As a woman would travail with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, Paul's talking to the Christians, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a three. You are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for an helmet and the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us unto wrath. Amen. That time, the day of the Lord, is the day of God's wrath, and we're not appointed to the wrath. Paul's saying, brethren, just be comfortable. You're not of the night. You're of the day. You're not appointed to wrath. Amen? Amen. That's a proof that we get pulled out before the great tribulation. Yeah. That's a proof. But that, but let us who are of the day be sober, verse 8, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet and the hope of salvation, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together, caught up together. Mm -hmm. Those which are dead shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Boy, that's just taking you right back to chapter 2, verse 17. Amen? Amen. Yes. We should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. You know what Paul's saying here? You're not going to go through the great tribulation and comfort each other over this. Yeah. And how many preachers that say they're Bible believers are telling people, you got to go through the tribulation? That's not comforting. Mm -hmm. Paul said, be comfortable. You're not, it's not appointed for you. You're not of the night. You're not of darkness. 
You're not a sinner. You may still sin, but you're not a sinner. Amen. Amen. Because it's your body. It's not your soul and your spirit. Your body has been separated from your soul and your spirit. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Is all this fitting together for you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The Lord's the, the 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 it's talking about the day of the Lord, the second advent. Also notice that the born again Christian is not appointed to wrath. I'm, I'm repeating this because I want it to soak in deep. Because in the time that we live in, you're gonna run into Christians that say your preacher's a false teacher. You're gonna go through the tribulation and you better make yourself ready for it. Now, we're going to have persecution. God promised us persecution. And we should be ready for persecution. But no matter how bad our persecution gets, and it's bad, not in America, but there's folks in Arab countries that are having their heads hacked off. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. That's pretty bad persecution, isn't it? Yeah. There's people in China that are getting beaten daily for their faith. That's pretty bad persecution. Mm -hmm. Praise God we were born in America, but I don't think we're going to escape. I don't, you know, American Christians have had it good for 200 and mm -hmm. some odd years, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think American Christians are always going to have it good. And you see right now, politically, the political parties are lining up against Christians. Yeah, some right. days they're going to start passing laws. They, they, I believe it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And just because... A church loses its tax exempt status doesn't mean we're now in the Great Tribulation. Mm -hmm. The Great Tribulation is going to be far worse than what even having your head locked off right. mm -hmm. and being beaten daily for your faith. The Tribulation is going to be worse than that. We're not going to be sitting through the Great Tribulations. God's exercising His wrath to uh, is towards those who rejected Him, not those who accepted Him. Right. We're of the day. We're not of the night. Amen. We're of light, not of darkness. Mm -hmm. Comfort one another yeah. with these words. Amen. Amen. And so we are caught up, taken by force to be delivered from danger. <laughs> from his wrath. That's danger. Mm -hmm. God says, don't fear him that can take your life. And after that, there's nothing they can do. But fear him who after you're dead can send your soul to hell. Mm -hmm. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. Amen. Amen. And so uh, our text not only talks about being caught up, but rather very specifically caught up together. It doesn't just say we're caught up. We're caught up together. So getting together at the rapture, getting together. Together brings several thoughts to my mind. Remember, this is both the dead in Christ and also those who are alive and remain. It's not the Old Testament saints because the Old Testament saint wasn't dead in Christ. Christ had not lived yet. There had okay. needed to be the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith in that for you to be in Christ. So when it talks about the dead in Christ, it's talking about the folks who accepted Christ from 33 AD to whatever the rapture is that died during that time period, they're going to be raised first. Together certainly implies a reuniting of our loved ones. Yeah. I believe my grandfather on my mother's side, a German guy by the name of we pronounce it Weitz, W-E-I-T-Z, but I think in German it's pronounced Weitz, not Weitz. Mm -hmm. um, a W has a V sound in German. I think you said you had a German heritage, didn't you? On my mother's side. On your mother's side? So my mother's yeah. side was German too, but but uh, I, even though I wasn't a Christian, as a, wasn't raised in a Christian home per se, I still remember, and my grandfather, the Day family and the Whites family are really screwed up families, just like everybody else's family. My, the people that I was raised thinking that they were my grandparents were actually my great-grandparents. Um, they had a daughter that had a baby out of wedlock, which was my mom, and they adopted. They, mm -hmm. Because back then that was like taboo. They shut up my mom's real mother in a bedroom until she delivered the baby. And then they adopted, her parents adopted her baby. And so 
mom was raised thinking her grandparents were her parents and I was raised thinking my grandparent, right. my great grandparents were my grandparents. Does all that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so my, when we'd go visit my great grandfather, of course, he, I thought he was my grandfather, but he was my great grandfather, so he was old. But every single day, out comes the Bible and a daily devotion when we were at his, not when we were at our house, at the day household, but when we were at Grandpa White's house, every day there was a daily devotion, reading the Bible. Didn't mean anything to me because he read it in German. Mm -hmm. He came here from Russia, and a lot of people don't know this, but there was a Russian community that was almost all Germans, they call them German Russians. Mm -hmm. And he came here from Russia, and my mom spoke fluent English, fluent German, and fluent Russian. She spoke all three languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't teach us kids anything because her and her sisters liked to gossip about the family and us kids not understand what they were talking about. And um, so they would speak Russian and German as they gossiped about the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I'm going to reunite. I'm going to be brought together with my great-grandfather who I couldn't understand what he was reading in German. And um, he died when I was like six years old or something. He's my great grandfather, so wow. you know, I thought I was ripped off because other kids way older than me still had grandparents, but they didn't have great grandparents. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand all that. I didn't find out till I was sixteen mm -hmm. that the person I thought was my grand, my aunt was my grandmother. We called her Annie Reed. Her name was Marie. Back mm -hmm. in the day, there was a lot of Marys and Maries that were given, right? And my Annie Reed was a twin to my Aunt Mary. And Annie Reed was really my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And me and my brothers <clears throat> tried to stay away from Annie Reed. And the reason why is, this is sad to me. My Annie Reed was too affectionate. Of course, we were her grandkids. Mm -hmm. And so we'd go to a family get-together and Andy Reed would want to hold on to us and it's like, yeah, leave us alone. Mm -hmm. Aunt Helen doesn't do that. <laughs> Aunt Dorothy doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. And she was my grandmother. And I found out right before she died that she was my grandmother, not my aunt. And I said to my mom, because my mom knew when she was in her teens, so she knew all the time that we were being raised that that was really her mother and that was our grandmother. If that would have been communicated to us, I could have had a much better relationship with my grandmother. Yes. Yeah. But it is what it is. Amen. Amen. So, sorry for boring you with a little bit of family history. No, but no, no. It's all right. So, uh, <laughs> together implies a reuniting of loved ones. Yeah. You're going to be getting together with folks that have died that you love. Lisa was referring to a guy in our church that we became really good friends with and He's gone on to be with the Lord. He, he uh, was a diabetic that lost both of his kidneys. He lived for, mm -hmm. for probably five to ten years without any kidneys. He had to go to dialysis all the time. And um, uh, he was quite a character. Um, be, re, be reunited with him. Be reunited with my mother because my mother is a Christian or was a Christian. Um, I think we're going to be reunited with folks that are loved ones that we don't even know are loved ones. What do you mean by that? If you have a great, great, great grandparent that you've never met, you're going to know who they are in that resurrection. Yeah. And you're going to have a love for them like you were raised with them here on earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to be a lovely, lovely time. There are going to be no yeah. hatred, no family disputes. Mm -hmm. You know, Lisa and I, we haven't lived by family for so long. Probably decades, don't you think, huh? Mm -hmm. And there's a side of that that's kind of sad, but there's a side of it that's a blessing because when we go back and visit, we see the squabbling going on between the family members that are around each other all the time. Mm -hmm. We don't have any of that. We don't have any squabbling. Mm -hmm. And when we go back out there, it's a time of reunion and love and friendship, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas if we were there all the time, we'd probably have that squabbling just like they have, but mm -hmm. there won't be any of that. We're going to be together in okay. love. Amen. Amen. But it's not just family members. We're going to be reunited with all of our loved ones who were in Christ, and we're all going to be together. Yeah. So if you have any um, mourning for a loved one that you know is in Christ, you say, 
for whatever reason, and I'm thinking about what you've told me, for whatever reason they were taken, when you get up to heaven and you reunite and you're together with them, they're going to say, well, no big deal. <laughs> I was here with the Lord. Mm -hmm. I was here with the Lord. I'd go through whatever I went through for a hundred times over to be with the Lord. Amen. 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 Celebration. And to me, it was only minutes before you were here with us. So I know that you missed me on earth, but it was just minutes. Mm -hmm. No, it was years. No, it was minutes. <laughs> Believe me, I was here. I was here. <laughs> And I was just waiting for you to come and join us. And all that reuniting. Yeah. It's going to be such a glorious thing. Yeah. Such a yeah. lovely thing. Yeah. Such a sweet thing. Yes. Mothers who lost babies through miscarriages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're going to be reunited with those. Those babies are a living soul. Yes. They're going to be reunited with those babies. And they're going to know the soul of that baby that never had a chance to sin, amen. Yeah. Yes. You know, we, we in this human life, we look at things so wrong. We're sad about a loved one that's gone to be with the Lord and they couldn't be happier that they're with the Lord regardless of what circumstance took them there. Mm -hmm. The baby who died in the womb and never, uh, their glory, they're in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and never had one sin yeah. committed. Yeah. Wow. You know, sometimes I think about that idea when the Lord gives a parable about the, the people who went to work and he went out, and the, the, the guy that owned the field went out in the morning and hired some laborers to go out to his vineyard and harvest his crop. And he went back a couple hours later, there was more guys standing idle. He hired them and sent them back went back every couple hours until the very end of the day. He went back at the end of the day where there was only like one hour left to work. And he said, go out into my field and work with my folks and I'll pay you whatever's right. Mm -hmm. And they went out in the field. And when the day was over and the man with the field went out to pay the workers that he hired, he said, bring those that came last first and I'll pay them. And everybody watched him pay the same rate to those folks as he promised to the guys that he hired in the morning. And so they supposed they were going to get more money because he paid them the price that he agreed to for the first folks. And when I came back to the first folks that he hired, he gave them what he committed. The same amount that he gave to the person who only worked one hour. And Jesus telling that story said, and it was a story. It's not a historical event because Jesus said, I gave you a parable. So it was a parable. Mm -hmm. And the people that were hired in the morning were angry with the good master because they supposed they should have received more because they, and they told him, they said, you paid them the same amount you paid us and we bore the heat of the day. Yeah. And they only toiled for one hour and you gave them the same amount that you gave us. And the master said unto them, these are all paraphrasing, by the way, I'm not quoting it word for word. And the master said unto them, isn't, isn't it my money? Can I do with my money what I choose to do with my money? Yep. Didn't you agree to work for me for this amount of money? I paid you what you agreed to work for. Because I'm a good man and I gave them the same amount I gave you, does that make me bad? And then it says, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. When I think about that, and I think about the judgment seat of Christ, and I think about babies who died in the womb, mm -hmm. I could see people that would, from an earthly standpoint, say, I had to fight temptation my whole life. <laughs> this character didn't have to fight one minute of temptation. And you've rewarded them just like you rewarded me. Wow. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Hopefully, um, we're going to be gracious when the Lord gives out whatever he gives out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can tell you this, whatever reward you get is more than you deserve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that he has punished us far less than our iniquities deserve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so just be grateful for whatever it is that you get. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so, 
uh, together also demonstrates the perfect unity of the people of God. Yeah. You know what? Right now we don't have perfect unity. We have people that say this is the absolute truth. And there's people that say this is the absolute truth, but not this. And we have people that say this is the absolute truth. Neither this nor this is the absolute truth. That's how Christianity is today. Mm -hmm. We're all over the place. And the reason why we're all over the place is the very reason why we have the name that we have because most Christians are not Bible believers. No. Mm -hmm. And so they operate off of their feelings and their emotions rather than what the Bible says. And so they're all over the place. But when we are raised together and we're changed in a twinkling of the eye, we're all going to have proper doctrine. There'll be no more of all this nonsense. Mm -hmm. no. We're going to be together in unity. And, Je and Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 that we're studying on Wednesday night will be answered. We will all be together in one as he and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. All of our stupid, petty differences will totally wash away in truth. Now, when I say stupid, petty differences, they're stupid and petty not because they're small differences, because some of the differences are huge. They're a yeah. schasm. They're stupid and petty because if somebody would put their nose in the Bible and actually believe what they're reading, this wouldn't exist. Yeah. That makes them stupid and petty. Mm -hmm. The person that's a schasm away from me on biblical truth the only reason they're a schasm away is because they're a carnal Christian that doesn't read their Bible and doesn't believe what the Bible says. Yeah. And if they did read it and they did, listen, I'm not perfect, but my book is. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm better than them, but I put my nose in the book yeah. and I believe the book. I'm a sinner just like they're a sinner. Or I should say, we're not sinners if we're Christians, but I sin just like they sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not better than they are. But the book that I have is better than the book most of them, that most of them have, because most of them don't use the King James. Mm -mm. And the book that I have, I use as a guiding light, and they don't. Mm -hmm. It's the book that makes the difference, not the person. Yeah. Oh, that Christians would get their nose back in the book. Yeah. I don't want to imply with me saying that about petty differences. I don't want to imply that it's wrong to hold the truth in spite of what consequences it brings in relationships. Hold on to the truth. Mm -hmm. Never yeah. let it go. If you have a friend that claims that they're a Christian, and I'm not saying they're not a Christian, but they may not be, but if you have a friend that claims to be a Christian that says, if you don't turn from this belief, I'm going to have to part ways from you, mm -hmm. you say goodbye. Yeah. I'm going to miss you. Right. Because you hold on to truth. Yeah. Compromise is the devil's number one tool against Christianity. Yeah. And he'll use the Bible to convince you that compromise is good. God wants us to be united so that the world will know that he is one. He wants us to be united in truth, yep, in truth, not in falsehood, not in compromise. Compromise is wicked. Compromise yes. is evil. Compromise doesn't bring any good thing to Christianity. No. And so if you have to lose, I've lost relationships of I have professing Christians mm -hmm. over what I believe. I had a preacher that I loved dearly, and one of the last conversations that we had he told me, he said, you know, you're going to be a great preacher if you could ever get over this King James stumbling block. Yeah. Yeah. We never had another conversation since then. That was decades ago. You know what? The King James issue is a big enough issue to separate fellowship from somebody with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that mean I don't, the, the guy, the preacher's name was Buddy Hoffman. Does that mean I don't love Buddy Hoffman? No, I still love Buddy Hoffman. 
But I'm not going to compromise the word of God in order to have a friendship with Buddy Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And when the red, and I believe from the bottom of my heart, Buddy Hoffman is a saved preacher of God, and he's going to get some good rewards for the preaching that he did. Amen? Amen. When we're raised together, Buddy's going to give me a great big hug and say, man, I'm sorry for telling you to get over that King James stumbling block. You were so right. <laughs> but it wasn't me that was right. It's this book that's right. See, my flesh wants to be deceived mm -hmm. just like your flesh wants to be deceived. Yeah. You've got to get hold of some truths and you've got to put an iron fist around those truths and say, these are not negotiable. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the difference between a conviction and a, and a preference. A preference is something that's smaller than a conviction by far. A preference is, I see like some people say, well, I prefer the King James Bible. That's a preference. It's not a conviction. What's the difference between a preference and a conviction? A conviction is something you're willing to die over. To me, the King James Bible is a conviction. Mm -hmm. If somebody busted into this church and put a gun in my head and said, either you start preaching out of the NIV or I'm going to kill you, I'd say, well, I'll go be with the Lord. <laughs> yep. I'm not going to preach out of any other Bible. It's a conviction. Because I know the truth. Amen. And the truth will make you free. Amen. Amen. So, this unification is not going to be a unification due to compromise. It's going to be uh, uh, that all of us will know and understand the truth. We're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye and we'll know truth. Amen. Those who mock the King James Bible will be red-faced to find out that God only had one book. Mm -hmm. And we're going to close on this, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And look at verse 3. It says... Uh, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. See, that's talking about unification, right? Mm -hmm. And the bond of peace. And then it defines what that unity would be. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So let's stop and think about that. One body. Right? Right. One body. One spirit. With me? Yes. Mm -hmm. One hope. We together? Yes. Uh, one Lord. One faith. One baptism. One baptism. One baptism. One God and Father and Father. One God. And Father of us all, right? And yet, 900 plus Bibles. Does that make sense to you? No. Bible versions. Does that even make sense? No. No. If there's, and, and there's one Lord, and that Lord is the Word of God, right? Yes. yes. So if that Lord is the Word of God, that means there's one Word of God. Yes. yes. Not 900 plus. No. Mm -hmm. Doesn't even make sense. Yet Christians all over the world, they don't get it. They don't they get don't. it. And they're going to be red faced. Yeah. They're going to be red faced. We're going to, we're out of time. Probably went a little bit too long. I hope you forgive me for going a little bit long. But it was a it's okay. It was a I enjoyed program. it. Yeah, me too. Let's go in prayer. Lord, we do 
thank you that you are God. We thank you that you gave us your word that we don't have to guess about things we can know. We pray that you'd help us to go beyond what our feelings are and go with what your word says. Help us, Lord. We're a needy people and we need your help. Help us. Help us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. We love you.